We're going to try our very best to get everybody, every American citizen who wants to get out, out. I think you have to go back and look at what, uh, what the administration inherited. I mean, we came in and we were faced with a May 1 deadline uh, to, uh, to have all forces out of the country. This, this deal had been struck with the Taliban. And so he had to very rapidly go through uh, a detailed assessment and look at all options in terms of what, uh, you know, what, what he could do. And, and none of those options were good options. He went through a very rigorous process, very detailed process. And so at, at the end of the day, the president made his decision. But again, uh, he was faced with uh, uh, a situation where uh, there, there were no good options. All were very tough. I think when this is over, the American people have a clear understanding of what I did, why we did it. And uh, but look, that's the job. My job is to make judgments. My job is to make judgments no one else can or will make. I made them. I'm convinced I'm absolutely correct in not deciding to send more young women and men to war for a war that, in fact, is no longer warranted. That's President Biden, and before that, Defense Secretary Lloyd Austin defending the administration's decision to pull troops out of Afghanistan as the mission continues to get all Americans and certain Afghans out of the country. Let's bring in right now former advisor of the Joint Chiefs of Staff and veteran Afghanistan reporter Sarah Shea. She's the author of the book On Corruption in America and What is at Stake. And Sarah, I just, I just want our friends watching, first of all, to understand how uniquely qualified you are uh, to be talking about Afghanistan right now, because you really invested personally in that country, not only as a great reporter for NPR, but even after that, you stayed there. Can you give, can you give our, our viewers a little bit of background about what you did in Afghanistan? Yeah, briefly, uh, I stayed. I decided it was time to try to do something in, instead of just talking about it. And so I launched the first radio station in uh, post-Taliban Afghanistan, and then I was helping reconstruct, that's what you're seeing there, helping reconstruct um, houses that uh, U.S. forces had bombed in the anti-Taliban campaign. And then a cooperative in which I uh, made skincare products with Afghan men and women for export. And then toward about 2008, I began just providing counsel to incoming military headquarters uh, as they were rotating into Kandahar because they just didn't have that much access to the ordinary population. And eventually I ended up working for two uh, commanders of the international troops in Kabul and then the chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff, Admiral Mike Mullen. Um, and right. if you wouldn't mind, I'd just like to spend two seconds talking about some of those Afghans that you just mentioned who are trying to get out of Kabul and that I'm trying, if I can, to help. There's the former police chief of Helmand province in the south who's badly injured or, or his health is bad because of injuries. He's got two widows of his two brothers dead in the fighting with him. They're trying to get out. Uh, there's the young man who helped me launch that radio station back in 2002. And, you know, he had an investigative program where he would go and, and uh, look into complaints about public services that people were receiving under the post-Taliban government. And then he would confront the government officials when he found that there were actually problems. Boy, I wouldn't mind having a program like that on US, <laughs> uh, on the U.S. media. This is the situation that we're trying to handle now. Right. So, so Sarah, when, when I read your piece, it, it, was, it was breathtaking, despite the fact I followed this story so closely for 20 years. And it, I kind of file it under, I knew it was bad. I never knew it was that bad. And I want to focus on two things that you focused on. One, corruption. And I understand Joe Biden going back to 2009, that dramatic scene where he throws a napkin down. He's so angry at Karzai because of the corruption, because they're not getting cooperation. Um, and I read your piece, and my God, the levels of corruption all over the place. Even for those of us who thought it was bad, we never imagined it was bad as you laid out. Can you describe that to our viewers? Basically, it's any interaction with an Afghan official, you would get shaken down. And, you know, Joe, if, if you had come to me and I'm an Afghan and you had said, look at Sarah, I'm a cop 
you know how low our salaries are. I, I have a third daughter that's just arrived, and I don't have, you know, sandals for the feet of the second daughter. Could you give me some money? Men, an Afghan would take the shoes off his or her own daughter's feet to give to you. But that's not how police shake people down. They shake people down contemptuously. They humiliate them. So it's not just money that people lose. They lose their dignity, and that's about all they had. And, and after a while, you get so furious, what you want to do is shoot a cop. Well, in Kandahar, the Taliban were all over everywhere. <laughs> it was almost hard for the men in my cooperative not to join the Taliban. So you get angry enough, you want to shoot some cops. And, and, and that's part of the problem. I had elders who would tell me, look, the Taliban shake us down at night, but the government shakes us down in the daytime. And so the idea that we expected Afghans to take you know, to risk their lives to defend a government that was treating them that way was really um, wrong. And I have to say, hey. yeah, go ahead. No, no, I'm sorry. I was just going to say, we, we, we have this view of the Taliban, you know, wearing the black hats and uh, the government forces wearing white hats. You being there among them all, you write in the piece that there, th for many Afghans that you interacted with, they really didn't see a big difference between the Taliban and the corruption of the Afghan government. That's right. And that same gentleman who helped me found that radio, he ended, ended up going to, this is back in 2010 or 11, going to an Afghan, uh, sorry, going to a Taliban kind of court to settle an inheritance dispute, even though he's violently anti-Taliban, because that was the only place he was really able to get, you know, a judgment that he didn't have to pay for. Thinking in terms of that corruption and the impact that it might have had on how quickly the country fell to the Taliban, what was it like in terms of the military and the levels? Of, we hear that the soldiers were not being paid. How bad was it? in terms of, you know, the daily life of soldiers in the Afghan army? It was bad. Um, it was bad, meaning both soldiers didn't have um, basic equipment, and also they, uh, there weren't as many soldiers as we often say there were because very often what you would have is what's called ghost soldiers, meaning names on the rolls, but no actual bodies connected to those names, so that, you know, their commanders, their, you know, colonels or whatever could collect their pay. So the numbers that you've been hearing about how many soldiers were fielded uh, are incorrect. Um, meaning that's not who were, how many were actually fighting. Hey, thanks so much for watching our YouTube channel. You can follow up on today's top stories and breaking news or catch up on your favorite MSNBC shows all in one place. Download the NBC News app today.